My name is Constantine Miranda and I'm a senior at St. Anselm's Abbey School and I'm here interviewing Father Joseph who has been at the Abbey since 1946. We're going to be asking him some questions about his life at the Abbey and his life before coming to the Abbey. Uh, Father Joseph, um, I read that you learned of the monastery from a military chaplain. Um, had you considered any other religious orders other than um, the Benedictines? Well, first of all, it's not quite correct there was a military chaplain. Let me go back into my religious background, which is a little bit unusual. I wasn't raised a Catholic. Uh, my mother was Catholic, my father was Lutheran. Uh, I didn't want children raised Catholic. Uh, they were married outside the church originally, although I was baptized as an infant. Uh, later on, I mean, I, I did know about Catholicism and I became very interested in it. I spent a wonderful summer with my Aunt Nellie Clark and Matt Toon. My folks thought apparently I was kind of peaked and I was in Chicago, I was always selling magazines or selling newspapers or working for the butcher and so forth. And they thought I was kind of peaked and sent me to a small town of Mattoon so that I could uh, be more quiet. Mm -hmm. And uh, at any rate, my Aunt Nellie was a very fervent Catholic and I was very much impressed by her strong faith. And uh, she had a catechism, which I studied, almost, almost memorized it in my parents of my own, and so forth. When I went back to Chicago, I tried to, uh, a couple of, several times I tried to begin instructions and never seemed to work out. When I got into the military, I started instructions again. Uh, I was, I've been in service for three years during the Second World War. Uh, I. Uh, started taking by instructions by mail while I, while I was at Shepherd Field in Texas. Uh, anyway, then I, a few more moves I came to a college training attachment at uh, George Peabody College in Nashville, Tennessee. I began taking instructions again. Uh, then I was going to be moved out, so I went back to this church, so, so Cathedral of the Incarnation, uh, and uh, to return the books that the, the priest had given me. Well, the one who answered the door was Father Charles O'Loughlin, who was a priest, not a chaplain, but a priest of this community mm -hmm. on supply. He heard my story and he said I'd been instructed enough. Uh, so he said, come back on Saturday night, I'll hear your confessions. Sunday morning, I'll give you First Communion. The bishop will be there. You'll be confirmed. They could do this for sure, because they might be sent overseas at any time. And uh, then he also uh, asked if I had been interested in the priesthood, which I had been. And uh, he began telling me about St. Anselm's and got me interested in it. He thought I'd send a furlough, spend a furlough here. Well, I wasn't going to send, spend my furlough in the service at, in a monastery, but I did stop here on my way to Chicago for a couple of days. And uh, he showed me around the place and so forth. And that's how I became interested. I, began, I became acquainted with Thomas Vernon Moore, who was the founder of this place, a very spiritual man. And uh, so that's the way it went. And in my years in the army, uh, I grew deeper and deeper into piety and began going to Mass and Communion every, every day when I could manage it, saying the rosary, reading the lives of the saints, and so forth and so forth. So, how did, so, how did your family react to your entering the monastic life? Well, kind of mixed bag. Uh, my, my, my sisters were very, I have two sisters, one older than me, one younger. They were very supportive. Uh, my mother also knew it was a good thing to do, but she, first of all, knew it was a life would involve some sacrifice, and she knew my father would be very unhappy, and my father was very unhappy about it. Uh, actually, he came around very nicely later on. He was a very good man. And uh, after he died, I had to go back to where he had been working. This was long after my ordination. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, uh, uh, I went to the one who was running the switchboard, and she said, oh, you're his son. He was so proud of you. He talked about you all the time. So he came around very nicely. Mm -hmm. And I also read that uh, at the Abbey, there used to be a seminary. Um, yeah, well, uh, first of all, I, I, I was sent over to San Samuel for four years of theology. Mm -hmm. 
came back here in 1955 and 19, in the same year I began teaching in the school. Next year, Father Gregory Stevens, one of our monks, conceived the idea of our prayer of preparing our own clerics. We had four monks who were come, getting ready to go into theology, and we had enough people with theology degrees to form our own uh, faculty of theology. So he asked me to teach scripture, which I did, and uh, so we taught this first group, went through them in, through four years of the whole thing. And by that time, at the end of four years, we had another four ready to go to uh, take theology. And uh, that time, actually, we did them for five years because they had asked a fifth year of pastoral theology. But uh, so, so for nine years, we had our own the, uh, seminary here. In what? the meantime, in 1969, actually 19. Uh, 59 at, in the fall so, uh, spring term I began teaching at CU mm -hmm. and then the next year I was full faculty in 1960 and I've been on the faculty ever since. Do you think that um, young men entering the seminary would better benefit from this sort of internalized education rather than one at a larger institution? It depends on what kind of faculty you have. I mean, uh, I can imagine a, a small community that didn't have really good people to could teach. I think that we, we did have good people who could teach well. Uh, otherwise, they'd be better off being sent to an institution where there was a good formed faculty. Mm -hmm. But it depends on, uh, I think the kind of education you get depends a lot on the faculty. And uh, so that would have to be my answer. Okay, and then um, kind of branching off of that, the Abbey is located in this urban setting. Um, mm -hmm. How has that impacted your life and the life of other monks at the Abbey um, in comparison to other monasteries which are sometimes located on very large tracts of land? Well, it's been a godsend to me because uh, it got me, in, first of all, I, well, it got me interested in Catholic University. Uh, I knew from very, very good Scholars there, Monsignor Skin, um, Lewis Hartman, uh, Raymond Brown, who came in as a visiting professor, and, and just wonderful people who were there that if, unless I was connected with Catholic University, I never would have met. And they were very, very good people and helped form me. Uh, and uh, then also ultimately began teaching there, which is a big help. I think it enriched my own life very much because I did teach in the Abbey School for 10 years, would have gladly continued, I'd gladly teach there now if they wanted me. And, uh, um, uh, but uh, I, I was teaching mathematics, and um, for the most part mathematics, I did teach uh, Greek and uh, New Testament Greek too, uh, but not at nearly, in the, not a graduate level or doctoral level that I did at CU, so that's, Everything that I've done, I think, teaching at CU, going out, going to San Anselmo for my theology and teaching at CU has enriched my life considerably. And over the years of being a teacher and a professor, how have students changed? Well, I would say that the students we get at CU, I'm talking about CU now, mm -hmm. are not as well prepared as they used to be. Uh, in terms of, I mean, I, when I think of the kind of things I used to cover with them in my classes and the kind of exams I gave them, much more demanding than I think it could be now. Uh, in terms of spelling and so forth, they come not very well prepared for that. Mm -hmm. And not, not well trained to study. So transitioning back to the history of the Abbey, um, you were here when it changed from a priory to an abbey. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that transition? Well, it wasn't a big thing as far as I'm concerned. It's mainly a canonical thing. Mm -hmm. uh, to be an abbey, you have to have a certain number of monks, we had 12 at least in solemn profession, and you have to uh, be in a fairly stable financial state and so forth. Uh, so when we were in, we could apply to become an abbey status. We had up saying, had been up, up till that time we'd been a dependent priory first of all a dependent priory on Fort Augustus when I first came here mm -hmm. 
and then we became an independent priory, and then become a, an abbey is not a big thing. Uh, we did had to could elect an abbot who's considered a prelate, uh, the head of the abbey, and uh, also we to an, to uh, what they call the uh, they bless the abbot and the shrine. Uh, the uh, archbishop was there to preside at this. Uh, and uh, so installed him as abbot in the community. And I remember he was very surprised uh, looking over things that the abbey had seven people teaching at CU at that time. Mm -hmm. Of course, we don't have that now. But, uh, but uh, I mean, it didn't change our life here very much. Okay. Uh, it did. We, we, we were deep independent priory. We became an abbey, but we continued with the office as we did before and so forth. And what advice might you offer uh, a young man looking to enter um, the monastic life? Well, what your advice, I mean, you have to uh, feel that you want to join this community, that you love God, that, that you, the people that are there are people you can relate to. Uh, and uh, after that, it's between you and God and the other people. But I think it's very important to feel that the people already there are people you can relate to. Mm -hmm. Could you recall for us the very best day that you have had while being a monk? Any, any day that stood out for you that you ex especially remember? I can't say I really. Uh, I've got, uh, I mean, the day I was ordained was very nice, but that wasn't here, it was in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I was delighted in my Lutheran aunts followed me into the church to get my first blessing. <laughs> that was a big day for me, but uh, I, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful life. I've been here for, since 1946, and I've never regretted a day of it. Mm -hmm. I, I've been very happy all the time. There are, every life has highs and lows and so forth, but I can't think of anything that was especially that would stand out for me. Okay. And if you were to think about St. Anselm's, um, where do you think the, the monastery or the school will be in 50 years or so? What do you see for the future? Well, I'm not very good at prognosticating, uh, or even I, I don't have a huge imagination to imagine what it's going to be like. I hope that we will a larger community. We were much larger when I when I first came here, well, there weren't that many there, but it's after the Second World War, a lot of people came in. Uh, at that time, we, for a while, we had about twice as many as we have now. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, if you look at the choir stalls, we had to put extra ones in to take care of them. Um, what was the question? <laughs> um, what do you see for the future? For the future, uh, well, hopefully that we continue to grow. We've been getting vocations. We've got uh, one in, in uh, sound profession recently, and three in simple vows. Uh, there are other people who are uh, nibbling very clearly in here in Clinton and tend to come here. So I hope the community will continue to grow. The school will continue to grow, it's, though I'm not teaching in it now, although I love the school and it's a very important work for us to do. And. Um, I'm sure the school will continue to grow. Uh, whether buildings, we're talking about buildings now. Uh, we've got some money that we uh, can probably, we certainly need to enlarge our library, which is very crowded. Uh, the school probably needs some additions too, but uh, I'm not really very good at suggesting <laughs> beyond that. On a, on a broader scale, what do you see for the future for the Catholic Church? Um, well, we have a wonderful Pope there now. I think he's, he's done a great deal for the church. He's insisting on the poverty of the church. Uh, the, uh, the bishops in general, I think, when, uh, I shouldn't say this, but I will say it. Uh, John Paul II was in there for a very, very long time, and he changed the whole complexion of the Episcopal, Episcopate because he, uh, appointed so many bishops while he was dying. And, I mean, they didn't last as long as he lasted. And, and uh, it's, uh, I think that, that uh, 
Pope Francis will uh, appoint uh, bishops who are under after his own heart, who are not looking to build big palaces for themselves or uh, huge apartments and so forth, and truly want to not to be out to gain a career, but to be there to serve service. Mm -hmm. I think this is going to be what's going to change the church, and I think the people that were really looking to serve the people to do it in poverty. Uh, do it in love uh, means an awful lot. I think it will change the whole character of the church if he lives long enough. Mm -hmm. And you've been here quite a long time, but that still means you might want to achieve more. Is there anything that you hope to achieve in the future for yourself? Well, that's why I'm asking the, what, the, <laughs> what I think they would be like in the future. No, I, I'm... I'm in the twilight of my life. I don't think I'm going to do any more. As I say, I love to teach. I love to continue to teach, teach for as long as I can to be a, a contributing member of the community, uh, to, to really doing things to help the community and make them good. That's, I mean, I don't have any ambitions beyond that. I don't, I'm not looking to be a bishop or, or anything else. I don't think we even have many seniors anymore. Mm -hmm. So transitioning um, to your professional life, um, I understand that the Catholic Biblical Association of America um, is involved in some archaeological digs. Were you ever involved in any of those? Well, I was executive secretary for 43 years, so mm -hmm. uh, I should know a good deal about it. Actually, we had, we, we were able to build up a fairly good um, uh, background in finance because the arrangement which went back to 1970 is when the New American Bible first appeared, because we had translated it, the bishops promised to pay us 25% of the royalties from that. And so we were able to stash it away and have a, have a good, um, assets and we are able to give out a lot of grants in various ways. We have scholarships to students, uh, uh, stipends to students that uh, had scholarships and uh, we also for a while were also contributing something to four different digs and uh, but no I never went on any of them but they, they would be very very important. One, one in particular that uh, that is still going on now uh, which is uh, headed by Giorgio Marilyn Bucciolati, who we had as our TV more lecturers last, mm -hmm. earlier this year. Um, that tell, tell, tell Mozan is correct, it, uh, it's the ancient capital of, of the Hurrian Empire, or Kesh, and they've learned a lot, lot, awful lot about it early histories back in the third millennium and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've never been there, but I uh, have a lot to uh, say about that. I said they have a wonderful website, by the way. So look, look it up and you find it. You can even find uh, the singing of an ancient Hurrian hymn. They found a Hurrian tablet with, and where they had the music and the music and the uh, text at the same time, the hymn to God, goddess and uh, they were able to inscribe the music and they had someone, some people, a group singing it. And you can find that on the website. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, and uh, you know, almost everything you do in archeology span is very helpful. Uh, first of all, the ancient history of these different uh, empires that existed many years ago and so many things that then contribute to our understanding of the Bible. You also chaired a, a revision of the Old Testament. Why is it important for us to have revisions of these documents? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, Brother Dominic would say, why are we always rewriting the Bible? <laughs> We're not rewriting the Bible, of course. But um, first of all, language changes. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to, they used to speak of the great gift that God gave to Israel was the corn, the wine, and the oil. Well, corn in those days meant any kind of grain. Uh, and uh, now it means like corn cakes or corn flakes or some kind of some particular processed 
cereal, the corn, or rather maize, what we could call you know, Indian corn. Um, it just means any kind of grain. So that's one thing we would change that. Uh, another thing has to do with the, and this was a big controversy, uh, inclusive language. Uh, the Bible is, uh, as written in the older translations, had he, he, he all the time. Generic he. Anytime you talk about everyone, you talk about he. Mm -hmm. Or man, you say man did this, man did that. Well, women now don't like it like that. And we have to, the Bible should be for everybody. So we try to avoid anything that smacks of sexism in a translation, and that's very important. And uh, Rome is not so happy about that. In fact, they, uh, are the, trans the, the Psalter that I was responsible for was turned down by Rome. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's still in use, so we use it here, and, and it's still on the, uh, you, can, you can still use it as uh, uh, one of the allowed biblical texts, and if you look on the USCCB website, they can say that. But uh, man, that's one of the things that the language changes. Uh, there are other things too, I mean, uh, a while back, they were saying using thou and thee and so forth. We got rid of that. Uh, now they will even put in brothers and sisters because when Paul was addressing the Christian community at Ephesus or whatever it was, he was talking to everybody there, not just to the men. So we don't say just brothers, we say brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not what the text itself says, but I mean, language has evolved, so we try to evolve with the language. Have you been involved in any parish work during your uh, lifetime? And if so, um, what are your thoughts on that sort of religious life as compared to the life you live now? Well, I've had very little experience and I've had some, uh, I've, I've, well, every time I visit my sister, I say, uh, I offer masses in the parish and mm -hmm. so forth. And uh, I have on times supplied in parish to give confessions and offer mass and so forth. But I've never really had much experience in that kind of thing, and so I'm not very well equipped to speak about it. I know Father uh, Christopher uh, has been in parish over in Scotland for a while, and um, other par other monks here go regularly. Father Michael, for example, Father Gabriel, go regularly to uh, parishes on weekends and so forth, but uh, I haven't been doing that. Mm -hmm. But you were also prior of the monastery for a time. Yeah. Um, do such do the responsibilities that you had as prior enhance or make your uh, everyday life more difficult, or, or do they enhance it? Well, I think any new thing you do is going to is going to enhance your life. Mm -hmm. It's going to enlarge it and help you in many ways. It was more work. I mean, there were things you had to do at prior. Uh, conferences you had to give the community if the abbot was a way to draw up lists of, of uh, duties for people and things like that and preside at times when, and so forth. But um, it, it's always enriching if you try to do something like that. So I consider it a, a valuable time in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was more work, but not, not a great more, great deal more. Um, and a Benedictine abbot once summed up um, the Old Testament as being about a justice and the New Testament being about mercy. Uh, do, do you agree with that no, comparison? No. The worst possible thing you can say about it. The Old Testament is full of mercy too. Um, I'm revising my textbook, God's Word to Israel right now, mm -hmm. and going over uh, Hosea, which is it's full of God's love. Uh, Israel is considered it was uh, unfaithful wife, and uh, but he is in love with her. He wants to get her back. He's going to do everything he can to get her back. Uh, he's speaking about, uh, I mean, just in a highly emotional language. I mean, God uh, speaks, uh, and Hosea says, God sends his children off in exile because of their sins. He says, how could I give you up? How could I give you up? Either, Judith, my heart is stirred. I will not. Uh, do this again, you know, so forth. It's just very emotional. It can be very emotional, and uh, the book of, of um, 
Second Isaiah is full of uh, passages like that. Mm -hmm. um, Amos, for example, can be very harsh on people, but it's because he sees that they are mistreating the poor. Uh, and it's the love for the poor, which is, uh, no, no, it, you can't say that at all. And uh, the New Testament has some pretty harsh places too. Uh, don't remember what passage. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's a, that's a kind of fearful mm -hmm. saying, but that's in the New Testament. And Jesus, of course, can be very demanding uh, and, and, and threatening too. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite Old Testament passage or a favorite New Testament passage? Yeah, I think my favorite Old Testament passage would be uh, chapter 2, verses 2 to 4 of Isaiah, where it speaks about all the nations going up to Mount Zion to hear God's receive instructions from the Lord, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, He will judge between many nations, and they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. One nation will not lift the sword against another, nor shall they learn for war again. It's one of my favorite passages from the Old Testament. The New Testament, I love the passage where Jesus says, I praise you, um, Holy Father, for you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent, but reveal them to the little ones. Uh, no one knows the Father except the Son, no one knows the Son except the Father, and him to whom the son uh, desires to re uh, reveal him. Uh, learn from me, for I am weak and humble of heart. My yoke is sweet and my burden light. Mm -hmm. Beautiful passages. Mm -hmm. uh, as a senior member of, of this community, do you have any uh, reflections that you could offer towards students or other members of this community? Well, all I can say is what I said at the beginning. I've been here since 1946. <laughs> I, I've never regretted a day of it. I think it's a wonderful life. Uh, I don't think they could find any better community to join. Uh, I, I can honestly say that I not only love every member of the community as a Christian is supposed to love, but that I like them all. Mm -hmm. uh, I relate to them well. We have a good way of having meetings in which we you know, uh, we, we, we express ourselves very well. And uh, there's not hostility there or anything like that. Uh, we don't have a lot in the way of ambition, people trying to get ahead and pushing other thing down, others down in the process. It's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful life. We're gonna do a, um, a quick lightning round where I'm gonna give you a okay. term and I, if you would just give me what, what your first thoughts are from that okay. term. All right, so the first one is uh, St. Paul. Well, all of his wonderful epistles, his, his tremendous work for the church, his travel, three, va three uh, missionary journeys, traveled almost all the time on foot. Uh, well, to read the passage where he goes through all the, uh, his trials, mm -hmm. falling trials, falling trials. Uh, that's what went to mind, all he did, the church, I mean, by the time he closed his life, the church was well known far beyond Palestine, far beyond, beyond Asia. If he wanted to go to Spain, whether he got to Spain or not, I don't know, he certainly went to Rome. The second one will be St. Peter. Well, okay, uh, St. Peter, as we know, had his, uh, his ups and downs. Uh, he was a very human person, so he could uh, say, I'll go to death for you without, uh, if, uh, uh, no, if, no, I would never de I deny you, I'd, uh, I'd rather die for you and so forth, but then that night he denies Christ three times. But then, or when he's out walking in the water, he uh, sees the waves and he gets afraid and begins sinking, and the Lord said, why did you fear your little faith? So, uh, but in the end, he ended up being, uh, a man of very strong faith and did everything for the church. How about Mary? Well, Mary's wonderful. Uh, Jesus on the cross gave Mary to us as our mother in the person of John the event, well, the, the beloved disciple who's, who is not simply a disciple but simply represents the Christian 
uh, the beloved disciple goes in the tomb and he sees and he believes. So he's the first one to believe, the one who rested on Jesus, rested at the Last Supper, and, and Jesus then gives Mary to him because he is the ideal disciple and giving her to him, he gives it to all of us. So Mary's our mother, and we know that she loves us, she's one we can always turn to uh, in our needs and prayers and, and, and have consolation from her. And last one, how about St. Joseph? Well, <laughs> he's, my, he's my patron, of course. Uh, I think he's wonderful too. Um, a worker, uh, like, I mean, like most people in the church are workers of some sort and they're not clerics like me. Uh, and uh, he's uh, the guardian of Mary and Jesus, patron of a happy death, uh, patron of the universal church. Uh, I think he gives the life that uh, we can all imitate. I mean, he was faithful in taking care of Mary, taking care of Jesus. Uh, that's all I can say. Well, Father, I want to thank you for uh, taking time out of your day to sit down with us.